uh, with Cengiz. Cengiz, how are you? Welcome. Thanks so much, Julian. Thanks so much. That's uh, great to be uh, being here today. That's really a wonderful opportunity. Thanks so much uh, for uh, the whole uh, Archivorum team. Yeah, absolutely. Before, before we dive right in, I just wanted to show everyone a little bit of uh, the documentary you made, uh, Frozen No More. So we'll start with that in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> This is Chokodach, a village 480 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in northeast Siberia and one of the most remote places on Earth. Leaving Zurich, the journey to Chokodach takes two days, including a four-hour flight from Yakutsk over one of the most pristine landscapes on Earth. It is truly untouched by industrial civilization, but also extremely endangered by industrial civilization. We arrive after two days, but to reach the field station, we must travel further north. We take a speedboat, as the river has thawed and opened, under the midnight sun on the Indigerka River. We pass the tree line and finally reach the tundra, where we conduct our research for the University of Zurich. But why go so far? According to United Nations Environment Program report of 2019, thawing of permafrost is one of the Earth's top five most urgent environmental problems. This frozen ground is extremely carbon rich because ancient plants and animals are not decomposed but preserved inside the permafrost exactly like in a freezer. In just three meters of the permafrost, more than 1,000 billion tons of carbon are contained. This is more than double the amount of carbon that has been released into the atmosphere by human activities since the Industrial Revolution. As the permafrost thaws, organic material that has been sealed in the ice for tens of thousands of years begins decomposing releasing carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Harder materials, like this mammoth tusk, stay intact. The Arctic is warming twice as fast compared to the rest of the world. According to a 2019 report from the United Nations, permafrost thaw is seen as one of the most important tipping elements that could precipitate a runaway greenhouse effect or an uncontrollable hothouse earth. In 2017, there was a big flood at our site, probably due to extreme thawing of permafrost. But 2019 was another story. As we can see from this drone image, it was one of the driest years ever. Every year with an iconic journey, sandhill cranes fly thousands of miles to northeast Siberia to their summer homes to breed. But with extreme drought, their breeding grounds are at risk. Last year, there was a huge lake here, and now this is what is left of the lake. But instead of getting a PhD to get into a hedge fund, you left the hedge fund to get a PhD. How did that happen for you? What happened? What was the drastic moment? Yeah, that's, uh, I know that's uh, a little bit, uh, I have a little bit unusual career path. That's uh, really true. I was like, uh, as you mentioned, I was having a really early uh, steep career path in the trading. And in the trading, it's uh, quite usual. Like if you're good in uh, trading, someone realizes it. And then uh, you had a fast run somehow. 
And then uh, in my case, I was 30 years old. And then I had my own asset management company. We were trading uh, with a seeded capital from London. And we were uh, basically trading uh, all the financial assets, mainly uh, commodities like oil and gold, foreign exchange, derivatives and uh, bonds, everything. And uh, that was really very interesting uh, job. I mean, I, I love trading. I mean, it's like, uh, it's really adrenaline. It's like uh, judging the situation, quickly deciding what to do, having the full responsibility of your position. And uh, it's a fun job. I mean, it's, uh, I really, enjoy trading honestly but uh, one part of the job is a uh, quite big part of the job is also reading you really need to read a lot and you really need to decide uh, on your own what to do and to be able to do that you really need to read a lot that's why one of my screens that was always uh, reuters old news and one day i was just uh, seeing their news about the uh, it should be around 2015 2016 i guess I have seen that uh, a news that's saying uh, the, the scientists are thinking uh, the world is living its uh, sixth uh, mass extinction event. And then when I have seen that, uh, that's like, uh, that was the first page, uh, first paragraph was basically describing what is really going on at the moment. Uh, what is, uh, what was uh, happening in the past, like mass extinction events, like five of them happened, up to 95% of the species uh, died out. And at the moment, due to uh, human activities, the world is actually in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. For me, that was huge news. I had no clue about it. And don't forget, I'm uh, really reading a uh, more than average person. And I really uh, didn't have any idea about that up to that point. Then I started to dig into the topic more, and I realized that uh, the problems are actually really huge, from pollution to uh, the plastic islands that you have just been shown, and also to, from biodiversity loss to climate change. And at a certain point, it just didn't feel right to continue what I did uh, when I know all those problems. But it was also kind of not easy to make the transition, because when you're transitioning, when you're, uh, when you're changing uh, where you are sitting you're confronting the reality as well you realize in all your life actually you kind of lied to yourself to be able to make your job keep going i still remember at a certain point uh, i was like uh, reading about the climate change uh, the the gas uh, the gas is different methane and these and that all of those uh, things and then at the same time i was having a quite good position in the oil and gas in the uh, in my uh, trading job. And then I was like thinking, okay, I mean, how, how much more contradictory I can be than this? I mean, like, uh, like uh, really reading about all these things, knowing all that, and then uh, like having a position in the gas and trading continuing uh, oil. And then uh, you obviously, you lie to yourself in that situation. You're saying like, yeah, this is your job. This is what you have studied for. This is like, uh, you need to, like uh, think of your investors that's like they are uh, that's the reason why you're there stuff like that but you as you start confronting the reality you slowly start questioning yourself as well your lifestyle uh, and your world that you build around it and uh, so basically you're asking i'm trading oil gas bonds in the shares of those corporations pillaging the world and my role in this position is huge actually it's very significant in that, because basically buying a bond of, uh, of a company, oil company, is you're lending your money to them to do what they are doing. So, so once you face that, and that's very difficult to uh, continue doing what you're doing, basically. And uh, this eventually you're going to face that. Eventually you're going to face that reality, whether that's now or 10 years later or in your death bed. And I really didn't want to look back my life and say, when I'm 60, 70, like, what have I done with it? And then I was reading a quote from Eric Fromm saying like, yeah, some people, they died before they were even born. And then I was like, okay, that's really describing me kind of. And then, uh, so I have basically decided I will not do this anymore. But, but again, like uh, once you decided not to do that, that's also not that easy. You need to explain yourself because as you suggest, many people in the university, uh, wants to follow the career path that I have uh, had, like uh, getting into the, uh, a good hedge fund and then uh, climb the uh, careers, uh, career uh, ladder there fa as fast as possible. But once you say, 
I am not going to take that. I'm uh, refusing that. You need to explain yourself. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, instead of being in the really like, uh, okay, you're, you, you had everything, what you're doing, while you're giving that up all, then uh, you're basically turning the uh, tide to, to the other side. And then uh, once you have a super prestigious job, and then all of a sudden you're becoming kind of a radical, like you're saying, I'm not going to do that. But uh, I just don't, didn't want to take part in it. That was as simple as that, actually. And, uh, but like, saying it like you're lying to yourself, but I'm, I'm currently, for example, making my PhD, as you mentioned, in the ecology, trying to quantify the uh, biodiversity loss in relation to economic growth, but you're still lying to yourself. I'm like uh, saying, okay, if I can only calculate that, if I can only show people that what this cause, then maybe they will change certain things. Or if I can only write this article, the things will change maybe, but, I know that that is not going to happen. I know that that is that is not the truth. So you can say you're still lying to yourself. But this time, the lies are not to escape the bitter truth, but to give, give myself hope to continue to continue fighting to continue what I'm thinking is the right thing and do as much as I can. I know that the focal point of your research is the thawing of permafrost in the Arctic. Um, as sort of like us laymen can you explain the process and why it's so important yeah that's like a again like once you have the uh, traders view yeah, that just uh, somehow uh, stays with you it's like uh, i would also like to explain from again a little bit from the trader view like uh, when i was a trader two things i really gained from trading that was one is objectivity because you really need to be objective about your position you cannot you need to judge yourself, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And the other one is proper risk assessment. You need to assess your risk. You need to know your risk as a trader. And I really value these uh, things uh, on me that I have gained through trading. And if I need to choose two risks that humanity should not take, that will be absolutely permafrost, towing of the permafrost and the biodiversity loss. No kind of return will ever justify taking such a risk. So, so let me start with the permafrost. That's like, uh, first of all, permafrost does not melt, it thaws. It sounds like a super small linguistic difference that uh, scientists are picky about, but it's really not. Let's say, uh, imagine your freezer at home, let's say you want to cook uh, spinach in the night, and then you take it out uh, in the day, during the day. And during the day, spinach basically does not melt, but it thaws because uh, it, uh, it is uh, basically organic material. But uh, in the same way, permafrost thaws as well because there's not only frozen water in the permafrost, but also solid frozen material such as rocks and also organic material like old plants and animals that has, uh, who have lived thousands of years ago, but not decomposed due to the uh, very short uh, growth season of the, uh, of the uh, Arctic. So microbial, pos uh, microbial decomposition doesn't happen that fast. As, as it doesn't happen, they just accumulate basically. And this is a very crucial point because uh, organic material basically contains carbon. And as long as it is frozen like spinach in your uh, freezer, that's no problem. The carbon is contained uh, under the uh, ground. But once it starts thawing, then depending on the conditions, carbon is released to the atmosphere in the form of uh, methane or carbon dioxide, which causes further greenhouse effect. And the thawing of permafrost is one of the feedback mechanisms further accelerate the global warming. As uh, let's say, for example, uh, once a trigger triggers the, uh, the process, like in this case, uh, human activities, once uh, the changes a little bit the balance, then the permafrost uh, starts thaws, thawing, and then uh, releases more carbon to the atmosphere, which uh, accelerates further uh, the, the permafrost thawing. And it begins a loop that at a certain point, if you exceed a certain, which is called tipping points, then you can't do anything about it. Even if you stop all the uh, carbon emissions to zero uh, from the human activities, that process, once it started and it exceeds the tipping point, that will just accelerate and accelerate and accelerate in a loop. 
And uh, it's also important how much carbon we are talking about. That's like, because uh, a certain amount of carbon is buried there. First of all, around 24% of the Northern Hemisphere land mass uh, contains permafrost. It's almost one quarter of it. And the amount of carbon that is buried in the permafrost is roughly one and a half times more than the current amount of the carbon in the whole atmosphere, which is basically huge. And that is the reason uh, like a UNEP report, report in 2019 states, it can lead to an uncontrollable hothouse earth. That's like once you exceed a tipping point, basically, you, uh, you end up in the uh, uncontrollable hothouse earth. And this is extremely important. And uh, the question is basically, where is the tipping point? Uh, the, the problem is we don't really know it. Only thing we know, the freezer store is open. And uh, it will be more and more difficult to close the door every passing day that we just don't take action. So that's like, uh, that is extremely important. But like, unfortunate thing is, that's not the only tipping element that is associated with the uh, Arctic. There are many other uh, mechanisms. They are having the similar effects, like, uh, like similar to towing of the permafrost, like uh, Arctic sea ice extent, or uh, melting of the Greenlandic uh, ice sheet. They also have uh, related to the albedo effect, which is very similar to the uh, towing of the permafrost. Along with these tipping elements and feedback mechanisms, Arctic actually warmed twice as fast uh, compared to the rest of the world in the last three decades, which is just incredibly, incredibly huge. That's like uh, this warming also uh, will affect uh, other parts of the planet through teleconnections. What happens, because what happens in the Arctic will not stay only in the Arctic. That is gonna be amplified and uh, affect everywhere in the globe. And what we have seen, for example, in the uh, last year, as uh, Emilio was also showing it uh, in uh, his presentation, the Arctic fires. Uh, normally uh, uh, to our field station, we need to take a flight from Yakutsk. That's basically in the middle of Siberia. Uh, 271 degree north uh, around uh, after a four hour flight. It is uh, really one of the most beautiful flights uh, ever for me because four hours long, you're just looking at the uh, ground and uh, there's basically nothing else, nothing uh, human made. That's just pure nature. And that's really uh, one of the, uh, yes, that's the one of the photos there. That's really like super small plane. You fly on the, uh, on the Siberian uh, wilderness, and it's extremely beautiful. And uh, this summer, for example, there were, and previous summer as well, there were huge fires uh, in, the, uh, in the Siberia. And when I, we also couldn't go this summer to a field uh, in our research group, our uh, Russian colleagues, uh, they were allowed to fly. And when I asked them, how was the flight? And then they were saying that was just blocked. That was just like the smoke. We didn't see anything because of the Siberian fires. That was so huge this year. And that will also have huge effects on the permafrost. I do wonder, according to your research and according to what you know, do you think we will in any way be able to mitigate it to a secure way or does it kind of look hopeless? It's a very difficult question and it's a very good question. That's like uh, this one, in my opinion, I am, I uh, want to see uh, the, uh, the, the, the glass is half full. That's not, we will be uh, able to mitigate it and we have to mitigate it because there, we don't have any other choice. We, the, the responsibility, taking this responsibility for the next uh, generations saying like uh, we didn't do anything. We knew it exactly what's gonna happen and we didn't know, we didn't make anything. It's just like, we, we can't do that. And I'm really hoping, my only hope is uh, at a certain point, we will make the necessary uh, to deal with that. So can you explain to us what, what the field work is like and what we should really take away from it since we haven't been? That is, uh, the, that is really like uh, the time in the Arctic really I have spent, uh, it was a life changing for me. It is really kind of uh, difficult to describe it, but let's say it like uh, this way. We are kind of a, a monoculture society. We are uh, like losing indigenous cultures. We are losing the languages. We are, uh, our food is becoming everywhere the same. We go to forest and then the old trees are the same in the forest, same species. Basically, there is no more richness. There is no more richness 
in uh, our culture in every sense. And for me, the Arctic is the opposite of it. It is one of the last pristine places on earth from the indigenous cultures to biodiversity, it is still intact and experiencing uh, this richness makes you literally a different person. And uh, for me, what was uh, really, uh, what was really uh, very different uh, is when you were crossing the tree line towards the tundra, you suddenly landscape changes dramatically. Like you, you suddenly become the, become the uh, tallest thing uh, in the, uh, in the area. This is uh, one photo from uh, my professor. Uh, she was taking it there. This is the last tree, for example. That is like uh, the, for the uh, indigenous communities there that is sacred. And uh, once uh, before they pass the tree line, they get the blessing of the tree. And that is like, you can see that there is nothing else. That's just like very flat area. And uh, that's like basically once you're above the tree line, you're the tallest thing. For example, when you cross the tree line in the uh, mountains, it's not the same because you still see the uh, the trees below or the mountain above you. So it really changes you. And once you're above the tree line, then you feel the wind differently and you feel the uh, air differently and you also feel the uh, rain differently. It's, it's difficult to explain, but like once you are away from the civilization, you also start hearing differently, smelling and like, it's like uh, your senses are uh, all of a sudden opens and like gets awakened kind of. And you also see, like you drink water from the nearby river, you catch your fish uh, to eat here, and uh, you really start experiencing the community uh, in a very different way. And like for me, what was amazing is when you're sitting uh, in the ground and next to you is like in a one meter square area, there's just sometimes 50 different plant species in some places, which is really amazing because you, I don't think you can experience that uh, in every, every place. And uh, seeing that for me, that is really like what biodiversity meant, a greater community that you live together and trying to give more than what you take from this community. So can you uh, expound a little bit more on biodiversity? What do we need to be made aware of and what is so scary about it? Yeah, that's like a biodiversity is like a, most of the time uh, you start with uh, ecosystem services and like that. I don't really want to uh, take that road. Like the look, look guys, these bees are very important because they pollinate our crops. Therefore, we should protect them. It's like I find it, uh, it's very anthropocentric view of the world. And uh, we should we should slowly realize is where we are living is a community and no species can survive alone. And the larger and the more diverse the community, more likely you will withstand the difficult times altogether. And uh, for me, I needed to go to uh, Arctic and uh, live in the untouched nature to acquire, acquire a different uh, mindset to understand my place in the community. But let's take as an example, for example, the sphagnum. I'm not sure, uh, like it's a peat moss species in the Arctic that uh, we are working with, but I'm not sure uh, how many of you have ever heard of that. Like uh, probably most of you uh, never heard of it. And you have the feeling always like, who cares about the sphagnum, right? Like you never heard of it, you, will, uh, you never touched it, you, you don't know it. But actually when the permafrost starts thawing, for example, then uh, first thing what happens is the surface water uh, starts increasing. And then this creates the perfect place for sphagnum to colonize. And once they colonize the area, sphagnum seals the ground and stabilize the towing of the permafrost. And methane emissions uh, from the below ground drops massively. So sphagnum helps really stabilizing the system actually. And uh, if you lose sphagnum, that you never heard of uh, before, your chance of mitigating the towing of the permafrost in the Arctic gets much lower. And uh, we have to understand that every, every species, every uh, species has a place, has a role uh, to play in the, uh, in the community. And their relationships are crucial to the web of life, life. And for example, a couple of days ago, IUCN, has just announced that 31 species has been declared extinct last year in 2020. I mean, uh, I would like to ask how many of you have even heard of that? And don't forget the people we uh, meet here, 
like uh, they are interested in these issues. 31 species a year means one species per uh, roughly 11, 12 days. This is just, this is just uh, extreme. And uh, we basically, what I would like to say is we just need to realize we live in a community and try to become again, the part of the larger community. And when species goes extinct one by one in a community structure, at a certain point, as it's a web of relationships, community will collapse. They cannot withstand that. And once it collapses, there is no, there is no return once it exceeds the tipping point. There, there is nothing you can do about it. You can't bring a species that you have no clue uh, back to life again. And uh, where it is right now, the situation is population of the species in the nature in the last 40 years have plummeted according to uh, Living Pl Planet Index. IPBES, they were just sa saying in their last report around 1 million species are threatened with extinction. So for me, climate change is the tip of the iceberg. And below the surface, there's biodiversity loss because of climate change, because but, but also because we are uh, using more and more of the Earth's land surface. And uh, this biodiversity change will also uh, feed back to climate eventually as well, but also to other social problem, uh, problems like we are right now living the, uh, the, uh, the current pandemic. This is, again, this is not to degrade the importance of the climate change. I mean, my own research was also in climate change. I'm still, I know it is super important and super urgent. But if we, find, if we want to find real solutions, we need to acknowledge and face the reality that we are currently living in a biodiversity crisis. And that is extremely important.